last week, we talked about the most important thing. And we talked about, do you really know how much Jesus loves you? We talked about, where do you get your information about how God feels about you? Do you know more about what the devil says about you than what God says about you? We, we ask a lot of questions. And then we talked about how important it is for us to get rid of our lists. Let's just set aside our pretenses and our performances. It's time. It's time to get back to what's most important. And that's Jesus loves me. We also talked about the marriage customs of um, the Hebrew marriage customs and how um, once the groom and the bride had had the contract was done that from that point on he was supposed to provide for her and take responsibility for her care and if that's true then the moment we ask Jesus into our hearts he becomes fully responsible for our care we don't have to talk him into healing us we don't have to talk him into anything it, he's already got the responsibility of doing it. He is legally obligated, love covenant obligated. And it would be absolutely illegal for him to ignore our needs. And he doesn't do things against the law. So what are we believing that would put a hindrance or a block in his ability to care for us? Um, then we talked about God designed us to receive love. Do you think it's going to... It'll be okay. Okay. God designed us to receive love so we could give love. We are wired to have God in us, to, to love God and to love people. So we're going to talk about something this morning, and it's having a foster child mentality. We once lived across the street from a family who had uh, three children, and they were foster children in addition to their own. These three children were so cute. They were, they were little. I think they were nine and under. And uh, <clears throat> two boys and a girl. And one evening, oh, it was about three or four o'clock in, in the afternoon, and the father came over, and he said, would you take the kids, the, the three kids? And his wife was having a miscarriage, and it was it was dramatic. It was terrible. Anyway, so I took these three foster kids, and um, I took care of them. We made a fun video, and and uh, I fed them supper. And this dragged on clear until late in the evening. I, I don't know whether I bedded them down. Um, they might have even spent the night. I don't know, but. Um, while they were eating supper, they were talking. And I listened to their little conversation, and it went something like this. I wonder if it was our fault that she lost the baby. We did a lot of fighting. You know, we, we didn't do very well. I wonder, if, I wonder if they won't want us anymore. And you know, it wasn't too long after that that um, I saw the social worker pull up and they carried the three little suitcases out and three crying children. They'd been there for a year or two, long enough to, to start relaxing and thinking, maybe this is the daddy and the mommy that I've always wanted. Uh, so as I watched them go, I thought, you know, here they are, these kids. They feel like they're never good enough to be in the, a part of a family. Um, never felt like they really belonged, and if they did, it would be jerked away from them. They always felt like they were on the outside of the family. They always felt like they had to perform and, and do everything perfectly, or they wouldn't be wanted. And if something went wrong, it was probably their fault. They were always looking for recognition and affirmation. Um, 
you know, we get that same mentality, don't we? And we find it hard to fully trust God, and we're not sure, are we going to be punished or hugged? Uh, did I do it right or did I do it wrong? It's my fault that they weren't healed. It's my fault that my parents got went through this. And, you know, you may have even grown up with parents that loved you. And you still feel that unloved, unwanted, foster child mentality. You may be an adopted child or you may be a, the biological member of a family. It doesn't matter. We were all wired for love. And it's the one thing Satan wants to cut us off, off from. You know, you can even be a born-again believer in leadership, in ministry, in a pulpit, in uh, a Christian ministry. And you can still feel that foster child mentality, can't you? I'll never forget. I'll never forget the look in the eyes of some of my students, high school students, when... They came to school one day, and they had had a classmate, former classmate from the public school. He was a Christian, and he'd gone out to the cemetery and shot himself, killed himself. And they were horrified because he did it because he didn't think anybody <coughs> cared. Nobody loved him, and nobody would miss him anyway, so why was he there? Oh, the deceptions we believe. But we... We can feel the same way about God, can't we? And so we go on and, and try and take care of our own lives, our own way. Why couldn't he receive their love? Why did he feel like a foster child in his own family? Why did he believe that lie? Why do we believe the lies that we believe? We don't even know their lies. That's why he believed the lie. He didn't know it was a lie. He thought it was the truth. And as the farther we go in this class, the more we're going to realize, whoa, that one's uncovered, and that is a lie. Whoa, this one's uncovered. That's a lie. And I've been believing that all my life? Wow. Well, let's take a look at the prodigal son. You know the story. A father had two sons, and he loved them both very much. But neither one of them could receive that love. The older one worked hard. He was obedient. Um, he thought his performance would gain him acceptance. It describes some of us, doesn't it? Uh, the younger one was selfish, self-focused, and his vision was limited to what do I get at the moment. He wanted his inheritance before he had the maturity to handle it. And we find ourselves praying for things that God knows. It's, it's just not time for you to have that yet. You couldn't handle it if I did give it to you. So this, this younger one got his inheritance, and sure enough, he wasted it. And he ended up eating pig slop before he decided to humble himself and come back home. Now, when the father received him back, what did the older one do? whined, pouted, um, jealous, yeah. Well, the father's love was available to both of them, but neither one could receive it. Why? And that's what we're going to talk about today. There's something we need, need to, a perspective we need to have, because both of those boys had the mentality of a foster child rather than the heart of a son. One chose to respond to the Father's love with performance, and one chose to respond to the Father's love with rebellion. But it's the same thing. It's a foster child mentality. Now, I'm going to tell you the story about a, a, a guy named David. He was a young man who grew up in a very harsh, dysfunctional home. He was an alcoholic until he was in the mid-30s. He carried these dysfunctional traits right into marriage, wounded the lives of his wives and daughters. He made a mess of his life. Okay. In his late 30s, he became a Christian, and he discovered that God loved him. 
and he wanted to see his family healed because he, he had an encounter with God. It was real. But it didn't happen because even though he'd had an encounter with God, he just kept messing up. He said, I just can't get it. He said, I receive all these teachings, but the love of God just won't move from my head to my heart. My family still has so much more healing to go through, and I know I've got to have a breakthrough in my fear of intimacy in order to help facilitate my he the healing with them. It's like I'm numb. I know the principles of the Bible. I know the principles of God's love, but it's never become truly real to me. Does anybody identify with that? We know it, but we're missing something. We're missing something. He knew the truth, but why didn't it set him free? Now, we can identify with Dave a little bit there. Have you ever experienced the cross, but you feel like you're still living in the tomb? You know the truth, but you still have a hard time trusting God. You know God is a healing God, and you pray for healing, but you kind of just give up on receiving it. Or you serve God faithfully, you read his word, you pray, but there's still a distance between you. And you might even feel like every day is just another day. I'm not measuring up. Oh, why did I say that? How come I did that? Oh, <laughs> you know. And we get to feeling like nothing that we do is, is cutting it. We're always making mistakes. We don't know whether God is punishing us or what did I do wrong this time, God? You know. What good does it do to sit day after day and year after year inside of a tomb eating pig slop. That stone rolled away. Why is it still over this doorway? How do I get out? How do I overcome this slave mentality? How do I overcome this foster child mentality? Well, I'm going to tell you the, the rest of the story about Dave because he did something, but it was pretty drastic. And uh, you might find yourself in a position where uh, we have to get drastic to get that stone rolled away. There's a place down there at the tip of South America. It's called Drake's Passage. It is also called the Sea of Fear. It's 500 miles of ocean. And if you'll notice the way the continents are, if the wind is blowing, there's nothing to stop it through there. It's like a wind tunnel. It's the most dangerous water in all the earth. And if you fall overboard, it's almost instant death. You, you've got five minutes. That's it. And then hypothermia will kill you. The swirling water currents that have no continent to block them, winds blow at 40 miles an hour for over 200 days a year, uh, waves come from every angle, conditions can go from absolute calm to just tremendous storm in just a, a minute. Over 400 boats and ships have been sunk there and the lives lost. So David signed up on that boat with eight others for a sailing expedition. It was a 74-foot sailboat. And they're going to go through Drake's Passage. Everything went fine until they started coming back. It was unusually calm. So they had every square foot of the sails up to catch any kind of breeze that they could catch. And they're sailing through this passage. And 1.30 in the morning, five of the men were downstairs, down below deck in the, and they were sleeping. The other three men were up in the wheelhouse there. And it, it was just fine. Warm, cozy, outside it's in the 30s. And then all of a sudden, there came one of those storms, no warning, the wind blew in so hard 
it almost immediately was a gale force. The icy sheets of, of sleet were going sideways. The temperature dropped well below freezing, and with those sails up and all that going on, it wouldn't take much just to tip it over and they're sunk. In fact, the list meter, okay, here's 90 degrees, the list meter would go this far, but it kept pegging out because they were, I mean, they were really going. The waves were rushing over the deck. The captain screamed at the other two, one of which was David. And he says, we've got to lower the sails now. There was no time for them to slip on their rubberized Arctic gear. They did put on harnesses, which had, had a 10-foot length of rope, and it was a lifeline rope that would snap to a rope that, or a, another rope that went from stern to bow of the ship so that if they did wash overboard they could at least bring the body in. The waves <laughs> 20 to 30 foot waves, boat crests go up on these waves, plaster them into the deck and then boom they'd fall down and the guys would be kind of suspended up in the air. They were out there trying to put these sails down. Well, the captain and one man finished lowering the sails and then they crawled back into the, the wheelhouse there and they're looking out through the window and, and they see David. He's still out there on the bow. He had the sail down, but he was on his knees on the deck gripping the wire railing and he wasn't moving. And they couldn't figure out what was going on. And every time the, the bow dropped, he was up in the air and then he'd be plastered to it and, and it was just going back and forth. That's icy sleet. What, why didn't he come inside? What they didn't know is that when he lowered those, that sail, he, the rope, as that big heavy rope, it was covering his lifeline. And so he was pinned to the deck and couldn't, couldn't go anywhere. So he couldn't move unless he unhooked that safety line. So it was like, do you want to die now or do you want to die later in a few minutes? And so which way did he want to die? So he's out there riding that thing, getting colder and colder, and finally he crawled back to the, wheel, the wheelhouse. He made it back. He didn't say a word. He just crawled in. The door went down stairs, shut himself in the bathroom, and they didn't see him for a long time. And here's, when he did come out, he wouldn't talk about it. He wouldn't say anything. He said, no. And it wasn't until he was on the trip home with his buddy that he started talking. And here's what he said. When I was on the bow, I couldn't get my lifeline untangled. I knew I was stuck. My only possibility of getting free was to unsnap the lifeline from the safety rope and make my way back into the warmth of the cabin without it. But the fear of being washed overboard hindered me from letting go. And I sat there thinking, oh well, this isn't too bad of a way to die. And that's when I heard a voice inside me say, live. I said, Father, is that you? And he said, it's time to let go of the pain of your past and begin to live for the restoration of your family. Just let go. I thought, I, I can't just give up. I can't end it here without living for my family, reaching out for my family so they can be restored. And he reaches over and he unsnaps that lifeline. He faced his fears and he took the risk to choose life. He risked letting go in order to bring healing and restoration to those whom he had inflicted the most pain on. Now, I'm going to, this is in red on my notes here says, for the first time, he made a decision that was not self-focused. Mm -hmm. You want to know how to let go? How do, you, how do you start 
receiving the love of God? Quit thinking about yourself. <laughs> it's real simple. Let go of that foster child mentality. It's, it was a decision to lay down his life as a sacrifice for somebody else. If I perish, I perish. But I'm going to perish living for somebody else. That's what it's all about. Now, stop and think. We've put up with a foster child mentality long enough. There are people that will not make it if we don't let go of that mentality. David went on to tell his buddy, he said, when I went into the bathroom, I curled up in a ball like a little boy. For 15 minutes, I stayed there because I realized it finally had happened. Everything he had been learning for eight years finally happened. He'd put it in and put it in, and he'd learned about God. <clears throat> but he said, for the first time, I felt the arms of my daddy around me, my heavenly daddy. And as I was lying there weeping, absorbing God's love, he says, I f the stone rolled away from that tomb. My days of eating pig slop were over. <laughs> In what is your lifeline tangled? What is keeping the truth from setting you free? And yes, there may, may be inner vows. I'll never trust men again. I'll never do that again. I'll never let anybody see me cry. I will get to the top no matter what it takes. <coughs> you know, it may be words spoken over you. My parents said I'd probably end up in jail. My friends are afraid I'll commit suicide. I'm just extra baggage. Then there's improper relationships based on how, how does this benefit me, me, me? What's in it for me, me, me? Oh, I want to be friends with him because I'll get to the top. We have our own agenda and expectations. We have self-protection mechanisms. And then there's comparison. Never be as good as. I'll never know as much as. God will do it for them, but I don't think he'll do it for me. And then there's lies. If I never try again, I'll never fail again. What about this one? If only. If only I had had a father that loved me. If only I hadn't been so stupid. If only I hadn't given up. If, on, if only, like the mother whose baby was in the crib and the grandmother said, you need to move that plastic sheet off the top of that bed. And the wind caught it because the mother didn't. And it came down over the baby and the baby suffocated. Mm -hmm. And that mother had, if only I'd listened. If only, if only, if only. How do I get rid of a foster child mentality and put on the heart of a real son or daughter? How can I unhook my lifeline? When it is tangled up in a mess of these kind of beliefs and opinions, and we've all got them, it's not just somebody else and it's not just me it's not just you you see when we are attached to wrong beliefs there's always going to come a time when we're going to run out of rope we can't go any farther we're backed into a corner and we have no hope it's it's over our choices are we can quit or we can just give up job's wife gave up on god his friends gave up on him. But we've got one more choice. Unhook your lifeline from the tangled mess of those wrong mentalities by deliberately choosing, I'm going to trust God, even if it means I die. If it means I lose everything, I'm, I'm going to keep on trusting him. And that's usually what it feels like that you're jumping off a cliff. There's nothing more that we can do. Sometimes you have to admit that you're wrong to somebody and it feels like you're going to die. <laughs> um, 
There was a man who gave his heart to Jesus and he was born again. He was a smoker. And it was like that one addiction just had a hold of him. And he couldn't, couldn't get loose of it. And he'd pray, he'd go to the altar over and over again. He'd just keep on praying and praying about it. And then he watched this guy off the street come into church, hear the gospel message, go to the altar, get saved. And immediately this guy is delivered from his drugs, alcohol, and smoking. And so this guy is sitting here thinking, hey, this isn't fair. I'm seeking you. And he just walks in and gets free. And he goes to God and he says, what's the deal? And God says, you like it. And he realized, as soon as God said it, it's like the veil came off of his eyes. That's why we don't let go sometimes. Mm -hmm. Usually, always. Because mm -hmm. we like feeling self-pity. We like being discouraged. It's a comfortable way of thinking. That's, we're used to it. Mm -hmm. In what is your lifeline tangled? Remember the Hebrew children when they left Egypt? Remember they had a, their lifeline was tangled up in a slave mentality. Well, that generation died and then God tells the next generation, listen to this. Deuteronomy 1, 6 and 8. He says, then the Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb saying, you have dwelt long enough at this mountain See here, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and their descendants after them. You've got some things to claim. They belong to you. God promised. He swore. He guaranteed that you could have them. And then the next one, he says, Do not fear or be discouraged. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you. According to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son. Do you know that you've been carried by the Father? All those times. Yet for all that, oh, look at that last part. You did not believe the Lord your God. Our eyes need to be opened a little bit. Deuteronomy 2.24 says, Rise! Is that going to take some effort? It's going to take a change of position, isn't it? Yeah. You're going to have to change the position of your thoughts. You can't think this way and rise. You have to raise your thoughts first, and then everything else will follow. Rise, take your journey, and cross over the river Arnon. Look. I have given into your hand Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. And then listen to this phrase, this sentence. Begin to possess it and engage him in battle. And then he repeats it. He says, begin to possess it. Now, Genesis 22, 17 says, Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants, Abraham, shall possess the gate of their enemies. Numbers 33, 55 says, But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land, those you allow to remain will become barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They will give you trouble in the land where you will live. Got a few barbs in your eyes and thorns in your side? It's time. Now, you'll often find that um, older people, did you ever notice that the older people get, sometimes the more stuck they get in their in their opinions. We've been through a lot. Older people have been through a lot. They've taken batterings and beatings and life has been hard. But watch this. 
they have a lifetime of choices that they've made. Either they've developed coping skills or they develop trust in God. They're going to go one way or the other. And sometimes, you know what we do? We develop coping skills in one area and trust in another. We're kind of like this double-minded, <laughs> walking this tightrope. Um, but I've seen a lot of times older people that kind of begin to get in a mold and they get hardened and they know God is, they don't have any trouble believing that there is a God, they know what the Bible says, they know they've made mistakes and they have blown it, but they have no answers on how to get out of this rut that they're in. How do they return to God? He, they've just, it's almost like they've given up and said, well, this is the way it's going to be. God's over there. I'm here. This is life. There's still that longing to know God, but it's, their hopes have been dashed too many times. Their expectations have been dashed, and, and they've just... In fact, if you could sit them down, you'd probably, if you could just hear their heart, their heart would be saying... Jesus, do you love me? After all I've done and said, do you love me? Okay, I'm going to give you something because this is unhooking your lifeline. Check out Jesus' response to Peter because you know what Peter did. He denied the Lord. Right there, almost in his face. He denied the Lord. And when Jesus is resurrected, he is on the um, shore there. The disciples are out there fishing, not catching anything, and you know the story. He tells them to throw the net on the other side, and they do, and, and then they realize, that's Jesus on the shore. Peter jumps out of the boat, gets in there, and he, I don't know what he did when he got to shore. He doesn't tell us. Because here he is running toward the person that he has offended. Isn't that something? It's like he unhooked his lifeline, didn't he? And he ran right to the one that he really loved, but he'd blown it. So the disciples all get there, they haul the fish in, and they have breakfast. And here Jesus does something. Now, before I tell you what Jesus did, Here's what I did when I would have to spank my son and punish him. I would deal with the offense. He would, ha he would get his little spanking. And then I would set this little boy with this curly mop of red hair on my lap. And I would hold him tight. And he would just melt into my arms. And I would ask him this question. Why do I just love you so much? I love you. I love you. Why do I love you so much? It's because you're mine. And I just, you know, talk to him like that. Jesus didn't do that to Peter. He didn't. When, when he, they finished breakfast and Jesus went to Peter face to face, he didn't say, do you know, I, do you know that I love you so much? He didn't say, I love you. Why not? If you stop and think about it, there was a reason. He asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Why when Peter was needing to know, Jesus, do you still love me? Why did Jesus say, do you, Peter, love me? And here's why. There is an immovable, unshakable, unchangeable truth. God loves you. All that he has done, there's never been one single thing that God has done. The Hebrew children, the 
time Jesus spent on the earth, the way of the cross, nothing that God has done ever indicated that he did not love you. He hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. There was a question that Peter needed to answer before he could receive that unmovable, unchangeable, unshakable love. And that is, do you love Jesus? All that you've done, have you ever quit loving Jesus? See, you need to answer that question first. Because God loves you. That's never going to change. There's no doubt. It is set in concrete. It's set in uh, law. It, it is over. It's finished. It's, that will never, ever change. But can you receive God's love? Do you love me? So in order to let go of the foster child mentality, that's the key. Do you love Jesus? He loves you. And those little foster children, as long as they were looking at people, at an at a earthly mama and daddy, even as... As, of course, a child is going to look for a, an earthly mama and daddy. But there's something greater. Do you love Jesus? Do you love him? And that is a key to letting go of that foster child mentality that a lot of times we struggle with. Do I love Jesus? Or am I kind of like that uh, prodigal son one or the other, who's always wanting God to give to me. I want you to tell me. I want you to answer my prayers. I want, I want, it, and do it this way. And mm -mm -mm. Next week, we're going to talk about taking the struggle out of believing God so that we can enter that place where God has prepared for us. We're going to be brought to a place like David was. It's a place of no return, like he was on that icy deck. Our former perspectives, our slave mentality, our foster child perspective, the lies that we have believed that stop us from taking our place in him, you're going to find that in this class they're going to start peeling away. They're going to start just crumbling. You've been at this mountain long enough. And God's saying, let's go. Come on, rise. Let's go. And we are. We're rising up, and we are letting go, and we are becoming family members. Now, I want to show you something. John 21, 5. Now, put your finger there and go to Isaiah 53, and then go back to Matthew 1. And we've done this in classes before, but verse 17 where it talks about, therefore all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And that is true. Um, you can count them. And then it says from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And that's true. You can count them. And then it says, and from the deportation to Babylon to the time of Christ, 14 generations. As listed here, it doesn't work because there's only 13 generations to Jesus. Where is the 14th generation? And you go over here to Isaiah 53.10. It says, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. Jesus had some offspring. And it's you. And God left a place in the book for your name. You are that 14th generation. You belong, your name belongs in that book. Now notice what in John 21, verse 5, these are his disciples, but he calls them by a different name. Jesus therefore said to them, Children, children, my 
children. It's a different relationship that he has with them now. You do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, no. You're missing something in an area, aren't you? And he says, I have the provision for you. From foster child to family member. That's what they went. They went from disciples to family members. And that's what God wants to do. He wants us to do that. Um, we are becoming family members. We're taking our place <coughs> in him. If you want to be in him, we need to really start at the beginning. And the beginning is, Jesus loves you. This you know because the Bible tells you so. Now do you love Jesus? So there you go. And that's the lesson for today. We're going to move from foster child to family member. And that's the beginning of finding your place in Him. Okay? Now close your eyes. And let that soak in for just a minute. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We love you.